just when I feel like it. Just when I don't feel like it. No, his mercy endures what? It says his mercies are renewed every morning. Every morning there's an opportunity to receive his mercy. Hallelujah. If you can, make your way back to your seat. You can sit right there. It doesn't bother me any. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. You guys could put up the title slide up there, just the one that says Kingdom, A More Excellent Way. You're still talking about kingdom? Yep. <laughs> Every bit. Till I see the fullness of it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. There's been so much happen already just this morning from the opening to the testimony. Everything is just, I've already seen the scarlet thread of what I I believe the Lord wants to do this morning and the word he wants to release and how he's just kind of paved the way. He has a tendency to do that. He has a tendency to make a way. Hmm. But we were... uh, First off, where are my family group pastors? Those that are in in the service right now, go ahead and stand up for me. Family group pastors, all of yeah, come on. Give them a hand, real guy. Give them a hand clap. I want you to look at their faces, recognize them, and I want you to get connected. I want you to get connected. He's called us to be a body that supplies one to another. They have a supply that you need, and you have a supply that they need. And we've got to come together in this. What a more, the times that we're in, we need, a, we need a, to be part of a family. And so there's, there's great opportunities to get connected with what they're doing. Uh, they're meeting in homes. They're meeting here. They're meeting out in restaurants. You, you name it. You know, there, there's, a, there's a spot to connect to, to grow in your faith, grow in relationship, and be a part of community. So make sure you get connected with them. I say all that to say, yesterday we had our family group pastors meeting, and uh, where we were just kind of checking to see how things are going. It says to know the state of your flock, right? And so we, we were checking to see how things are going and, and everything, and in the midst of that, Holy Spirit just started moving. We, st- <laughs> we started discerning the time and the season in which we're living in, uh, in this moment, talk, and Pastor Sander brought up the verse about the sons of Issachar, which was one of the tribes of Israel. The sons of Issachar, it said, they had understanding, they had discernment, they could able to recognize the timing and the seasons so that Israel would know what to do. So they knew that there was a certain timing to move in. Ecclesiastes tells us, to everything there is a timing and a season, and there's a purpose under heaven for that timing and season. There's a time to weep, there's a time to, 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 to have joy, there's a time to, to to die there's a time to be born there's a time to laugh there's a time to cry there's a time for peace and a time to war and each one of those times has a purpose in it we as believers have got to be able to discern the timing and the seasons in which we're living in and so this morning I'm going to talk to you about this kind of this time frame or this season that we're in and and I and, and I've already talked with some of you guys and some of you've already just come up and started sharing with me what you've been feeling and I was just like Lord this 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 is right where we're at you know it's just confirming to me what what the Lord is uh, doing this morning so I want to we've got it up there good we're going to talk about the kingdom and the subtitle if you would would be navigating the narrowness navigating the narrowness or or how how to go ahead and go to the next slide for me navigating the narrowness wintering this time called between the straits or in some translation and I'm not talking about the band here but it's called dire straits dire straits I want you to see that picture that's actually from Chattanooga a place called Fat Man Squeeze (laughs) at Lookout Mountain (laughs) some of you might have to walk that by faith I don't know I know I would (laughs) That would definitely be a faith walk for me. I don't know. So maybe enough anointing oil and just smear it on me. I may have to squeeze through. So hey, enough anointing on it, you can squeeze through on any type place. Come on. 
navigating the narrowness. How many of you have ever been felt like you've been in a tight place? Show of hands, come on. Yeah, just a few of you. How many of you have felt like you've been in a place where there's just pressure from all sides? Front, back, side, side, top, bottom, inside out. Same here. There's a lot of different things that could be happening in that, but there's also some seasons that we need to be able to discern where there's, there's certain timings where we can see that the enemy comes in and, and, and tries to bring pressure and tries to get us to conform uh, to his image. See, the enemy uses pressure. There's different pressures. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but it's all right. There's different pressures. There's pressures from the outside, and then there's pressure from the inside. And outside exterior pressure is usually an attack from the enemy trying to get us to be conformed to the enemy's image. Interior pressure is usually the Lord trying to conform us to his. But uh, with the eyes of the kingdom, believers in the kingdom that seek first the kingdom and knowing that all these things will be added unto you, we're not conformed to the outside conditions. We're not conformed to the outside pressures. Just like we could be like Jesus is our model for the walk in the kingdom. You hear that? Jesus is our model for the walk in the kingdom. So when a storm showed up and he was in the boat, what was he doing? He didn't allow the outside conditions to affect his inner peace. His interior world was in complete shalom or peace, complete wholeness. Even though the chaos was all around him. See, the kingdom brings order in the midst of chaos. So the kingdom person brings order in the midst of chaos. The kingdom person maintains its faithfulness in the things of God in the midst of an unfaithful situation. It maintains righteousness in the midst of unrighteousness. It maintains justice in the midst of injustice. And it wants to see justice encroach and invade like leaven upon the injustices of the things around them. I want you to go with me to Psalm chapter... Go to the next slide, actually. Go to the next slide. I want you to look at this. Ever felt like that ship? <laughs> having, to, having to keep things just right or, or you can make a shipwreck to one side or the other. And that's the tactic of the enemy to make a shipwreck of your faith. See, there's a process and it's this narrow way or this straight gate. It doesn't mean that it's straight as far as just, you know, properly aligned, which it, it is. Straight is a word we'll look at here in a minute that, that, that means a narrowing, a narrow place. So a lot of times I felt like this ship trying to navigate through tight places and, and, and then, see, that's a nice picture there because the, the water's calm. <laughs> There's sometimes that water's a little rocky and it can get my ship going from side to side and I start having the sway or, or a wind or a wave comes and tries to get me off course. But I know that the Lord is faithful in His goodness to bring me through the tight places. Go to the next slide. There we go. Lamentations chapter 1 and verse 3. Just write that down. That's where we're going to come from today. Lamentations? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Go to the book of Jeremiah and then just flip, flip over one more, one more book. It's Lamentations. A lament is actually like a funeral song. It's a song that's sung at funerals. There's this time frame on the Hebraic calendar, which is a little bit, it falls a little bit different on our Gregorian calendar. It falls the month of Tammuz, which is the fourth month, to the fifth month, which is the month of, the, of Av. Av. Usually this time frame is, is July, August on our, our calendar. I'm talking about a specific time frame on this calendar, whereas there's been some biblical events that have happened in this place called the dire straits, or be, this place called between the straits. It's this time frame on the Hebraic calendar known as between the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Av. 
the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Av. It's a three-week time frame. A three-week, three cycles of seven. It's a three-week time frame. During this time frame, all throughout Jewish history, you'll see that there were different uh, tragedies that have happened. I'm going to show you some here in a little bit. But there were different distresses and tragedies of things that came against the Jewish people. And and, and like I said, we'll we'll look at some of those here in a minute. But I want you to look at this verse in Lamentations 1. I'll get to that in just a second. It says, How does the city set alone or solitary? This is King James Version, I think, here. but That was full of people. How does the city that, that was once full of people was now alone? And it says, how is she become a widow? See that was, see, she that was great among the nations and princes among the provinces. How is she become a tributary? It says, she weepeth sore in the night and her tears are on her cheek among all her lovers. She has none to comfort her. All her friends, listen to this, all her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. She has dwelt among the heathen. She finds, listen to this, no rest. And all her persecutors overtook her between the straits. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. Now, this, there were some natural events that this applies to, but I want to put a spiritual application to it as believers today. Is that all right? So between the straits, this, this strait is, a, is this narrow place, this narrowing place, this tight place, if you will. I want you to listen to what had happened. Have you ever noticed that, 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 that maybe in your life, and, and maybe it's in, some, in your business or in your job or, or wherever you're at, that it seemed to be once full, now all of a sudden it's empty? It starts dwindling down. It says that the city that was once full is now become solitary. It's now become lone. There was a decrease in in who was there. How she's become a widow. One of the main root words for widow simply means without. You used to have, now you have not. In whatever shape or form. It says, she weeps sore in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks among all her lovers that she has none to comfort her. Have you ever felt like you've been in a tight place and you've got, not got any comfort at all? Now, th- this is a big one here. All her friends, what did we say there? Friends. Look around and say, not you, neighbor. I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about you. It says, friends have dealt treacherously with her. Have you ever been in a season where friends did you wrong? Yeah. Have you ever been in a season where there have been some friends that were friends to you? They're, maybe they were seasonal friends. Maybe, maybe they had an ulterior motive, and when they didn't get what they wanted, then they started dealing with you a little differently. They were friendly in one season, became foe in the next. Ah. Have you ever been in a season where friends all of a sudden it's just easily offended? You tell them something with a pure heart and a pure motive, but they suddenly just take offense to it and don't talk to you for weeks. You ever been there? It could be because you're in the season of the dire straits. It could be because you're in the season of a, a narrowing place or a tight place. Where once people were friendly to you, now they, now they start offending you and you offending them. And, and, and the language gets changed and all of a sudden, you know, you, there's backbiting and all this arguing and all these different things going on. There once there was a lot of people, now things starting to thin out just a little bit. Ah, hallelujah. Listen to this. Judah has gone into captivity. That's 1-3. One, one, What's Judah mean? Have you ever felt like your praise has been held captive? Amen. Have you ever been in a time where you felt like you just couldn't lift your hands unto the Lord? Where you feel like you couldn't pray unto the Lord? Where you feel like you couldn't shout unto the Lord? Where you feel like you just couldn't lift your hands? Have you ever felt like a prisoner that's been captive and there was a cry on the inside but it just couldn't come out? Ever been there? I have. You need to discern the season. You're probably going through the straits. 
you're probably passing through this place called between the straits. Go to the, go to the next slide, if you will. There it is, right there. Leave that one up. Leave that one up right there. Between the straits, we get this word, metzar, which means something tight, trouble or distress. Ever felt, have you ever been in distress? Tight, trouble, or distress. Go to the next one. I want you to, I'm going to go through these first, and then we'll get back. I, during this time frame, I'm, I'm going to address some of the, the Jewish people, some of the events that happened during this time frame. Remember, this is a season of three weeks, okay? From the 17th of Tammuz, which is usually around towards the end of July, it rotates each year on the Gregorian calendar, but somewhere around the end of July to the first part of August, during this season. And so these are some events in history that happened during this season known as Between the Straits, leading up to uh, the 9th of Av. There was, and I'll, I'll sum it up with this. There was a breaking, a burning, and a breaching. During this time frame, there was a breaking, a burning, and a breaching. During this time frame in history, this is the 17th of Tammuz is, is historically when Moses came down the first time from the mountain after being with the Lord for 40 days. On Pentecost, he was with the Lord for 40 days. He came down with the two tablets of stone. He came down the mountain, and what did he see? What did he see? What was happening down at the base of the mountain? Idol worship. The golden calf, Right? What did he do with the tablets? He broke the, broke the laws of God. That happened on the 17th of Tammuz, which falls 40 days after Pentecost. Moses was on the mountain for that time frame. He comes down. The first worship act in freedom was idolatry. I'll let that sink in for a minute. They were worshiping absent of the word. You start building golden calves when you try to worship absent of the word. That's a free little nugget right there. Just kind of, some of y'all know what that means. Ah, when I get that download. <laughs> but that, that was said to happen on the 17th of Tammuz. In 586 BC, the daily offerings in the first temple, Solomon's temple, were suspended during the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. So, offerings started to decrease. Hello, pastors out there. Summertime, most of you know, people are going on vacation, they're doing all these different things, and what happens? Whoosh, giving starts to go down usually, but thankfully, not in this house, because we're blessed. Thankfully, not in this house, because we understand kingdom. We understand we're not moved by the conditions of the world. We're not moved by the outward conditions because we have an interior world that's in order. That's right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Another event that happened in 69 AD, just before the complete destruction of, uh, of the Temple Mount area. In, in 69 AD, the walls of Jerusalem were breached by, by the Roman Empire, making the beginning of the destruction and the end of the second tem temple in 70 AD. Another thing that happened was there was a great revolt where a Torah scroll was burned and there were abominable acts done. I won't go into much detail with that, but there was a lot of abominable acts done uh, perverting the, the Torah scroll and the temple. And then this time during the Antiochus Epiphanes as well, there was a time that, that there was a, an offering made, a, a pig was put on the altar. And if you know anything, that pigs are not kosher, they're, not, they're against the law. And so that there, it was known as the abomination that made desolate. And so these were some of the events that happened on the 17th of Tammuz. Now let's go on a little bit more to the ninth of Av, and I want you to listen to some of these things. Hallelujah. Children of Israel, believe the bad report. 
Here they were on... <laughs> Here they were on the verge of inheriting the promise and on the verge of getting the promised land that was being given to them on the verge of promise and they forfeited promise because they believed a bad report. God called it what? A good land. Right? If you missed out on that series, go back and watch Gardeners of the Good Land. We broke all that down about, about how, how the Lord called it good, but the people called it evil. And because the people's words didn't line up with the word of the Lord, they forfeited their inheritance. Until a new generation rose up, they had to be recircumcised so they could actually enter in. I mean, a layer of flesh had to be removed so they could inherit promise. Children of Israel believed a bad report about the good land. 338 B.C. roughly, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed and burned down the first temple. Uh, you see the next one. Titus Vespasian had destroyed the second temple. Go to the next slide. These are the events that actually happened on the, the ninth of Av. The last stronghold of the rebelling Jews that, 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 were, that were trying to get back the land. Re, the rebelling Jews had felt Shimon Bar Kokhba, the great leader of the rebels, was killed. A few years after the defeat, it says the Roman governor, Turnus Rufus, had plowed the temple area and its surroundings, fulfilling the scripture in Micah. Therefore, because of you, Zion, will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will be like a heap of rubble. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. Micah 3, 12. The word of the Lord is true, guys. It fulfilled that word. Again, Romans forbade the Jews to live in Jerusalem, and they end up calling it, uh, they didn't call it Jerusalem anymore. They called it Elia Capitolina. Go to the next one. Just some more events to bring in more current on what happened during this time frame, and more specifically now we're talking about the ninth of Av. Some of the things that happened in 1095, Pope Urban II had announced the beginning of the first crusade where Christians went and did some bad things. 1146, terrible pogrom. Pogroms is a Russian word for massacre in Germany and France. Not 1290, the beginning of the exile of the Jews from England. 1348, the Jews were accused to be the cause of the largest plague in history known as the Black Death. They said they were wanting to take over, and so they kind of blamed them for, for starting the, the, the disaster and the disease. Uh, we have 1492. Uh, we have the Spanish Inquisition, the King of Spain, Ferdinand II, and Queen Isabel I decreed that the exile of the Jews from Spain. 1555, we see the Jews of Rome were moved to a ghetto. Go to the next one. 1648, the massacre of hundreds of thousands of the Jews in Poland, Ukraine, and Bessarabia, organized by Kelmanitsky and Associates. Again, 1882, another wave of massacre happens. Uh, 1914, during the 9th of Av, look what happens. World War I is declared. 1942, the beginning of the deportation of Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto to the Treblinka death camp. Cycles and seasons. This all happened during this time frame. They were going through tight places, narrow places, not just here in the scriptures, but I'm talking even modern day you can see during this time frame it was a tight situation it was a narrow place there was a refining and things that that were happening in the midst of this these were events that that were happening i want you to bring up psalm chapter three psalm chapter three i promise there's good news <laughs> it gets better Psalm 3 says, this is, this is David when he was fleeing from Absalom. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and I slept. Come on. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. Hallelujah. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, and save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on their cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Where's the blessing lie? Upon 
His people. The blessing is upon His people. People will say there's no help for God. There's no help from Him. When you're in the top place, you need to go here and get help. Go to this place and get help. But we, we go to every other source but the Lord. We end up going to every other source but the one who can actually help us through our tight space. The one who can actually help us through our, who can help us navigate the narrowness. See, that time frame, guys, it just strikes me because the more I'm thinking about it. That time frame was a time frame they were supposed to inherit promise. And then because of their unbelief, because of a negative report, because their, their words didn't line up with his words on what they said about the land, even though there were giants in it, even though the enemy was in the land, the Lord still called it good. That's kingdom. Wheat and tares grow together in the same field. We've got to recognize that the goodness of the Lord, even in the midst of, of a corrupt generation, you're called to manifest the goodness of the Lord in the midst of a corrupt generation. That's what our assignment is. Some of those people that did that, <laughs> some people that na navigated the narrow places. Who comes to mind? Anybody come to mind? How about Joseph? Go to, go to Genesis 39. Hallelujah. Let's go there for just a minute. Genesis 39. Genesis 39, and we'll probably look at verse 2, I believe. Yeah. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him in the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 2 there. Did you see that? The Lord was what? The Lord was with Joseph, and he was what? A prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master in the Egyptian. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was a prosperous man. Why? Because the Lord was with Joseph. Where, was, where did Joseph just come out of? A pit. He had been put in a pit by his own family. Dire straight, your friends. People that were in your family. In this time frame, in this season, uh, there's a lot of bickering that goes on even in your family. Families are on edge with one another. I mean, that can happen different times, but I'm telling you, there's an increased measure of discerning the season that we're in. So he was put in a pit. We know what, from the pit what happened. He went into Potiphar's house. There he's falsely accused of all kinds of sexual immorality, right? But then what does it say again? The Lord was with Joseph and he was prosperous. What? You mean he wasn't just prosperous because he went to church? He was prosperous out there? He was prosperous in the things of the world? He was prosperous in an unrighteous situation? He was prosperous in the midst of people that didn't know the Lord? Ever bit. He was prosperous even when people falsely accused him? When people start running their mouths about you? I'm still prosperous because I know who I am and I know who's in me. And I'm, part, and I'm not part of all this mess that's going on. This outward condition is not affecting my interior world because I'm seated with him in heavenly places. He goes from there to, to what? The prison? Look at this verse. Um, hallelujah. Go to Genesis 39, 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. Everybody said amen. amen. <laughs> put him in the prison. 
a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But look at verse 21. But the Lord was what? And showed him what? Hallelujah. Your mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper. So even in the prison. Now he had favor in the pit. He had favor in Potiphar's house, right? The Lord was with him. Even in that situation, the Lord was with him. He wasn't moved by the outward conditions because his interior world was in order. And then what happens now? He's put into a prison. Well, maybe if I can bring a different type of condition around him. Maybe if I can put him in a different environment, that environment will get in him. See, as kingdom people, I heard Dan Muller say this, don't let the sin against you produce sin in you. Joseph didn't allow the sin against him to produce sin in him. He had every right to be angry. He had every right to be bitter. He had every right to throw a pity party, did he not? Literally a pit party. (laughs) Pastor dad jokes, sorry. Some of y'all getting it now, come on. (laughs) He had every right to throw a pity party. I'm losing it now. He had every right, but he he, he remained faithful because the Lord was with him. In the prison, he had every right to be sitting there all sold up and angry and bitter at God even. Lord, you're with me, but why am I here? I'm a believer, why am I going through this? Anybody ever said that one? Because he's bringing us through the straits. Joseph was going between the straits. He was going between the narrow places because there was a destiny on his life. And the Lord was trying to shape and mold him through those narrow places, through those hard places, trying and shaping his character so that his gifting and character could be merged together and he'd be able to sustain the gifting that was on him. If you can, his character had to be able to sustain the gifting that was on him in order so he could sustain two nations. The Lord was with Joseph. Look at verse, verse 23. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. He prospered in prison. What? He prospered in prison. Why? Again, because he had this interior world. He was seeking kingdom first. He had this thing right, and so this thing on the outside couldn't affect what was on the inside. How many of us are allowing our environment to affect our ecosystem in here? How many of us are allowing the environment of the things around us to start becoming things in us instead of the things in us manifesting around us? The greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. How come when things come against me, the greater doesn't come out? As a believer, it should. He got to the point where he was even put into the palace, right? What was his job in the palace? Pharaoh recognized that God was with him, that he was able to endure, that he remained faithful all the way up into the point of the palace. And then his gifting of dream interpretation, right? His gifting of understanding that interpretations belong to the Lord. He knew how to get access to the, to the divine interpreter. So, so when Pharaoh had a dream about, about basically a famine come up on, on the land, and seven years of plenty, seven years of lack, Joseph knew what to do. And because Joseph had a strategy, he had, his character had been through the fire. Now his gifting was upon his character. And instead of holding back the revelation where he could cause himself to prosper, he wanted to be a blessing to those around him. He was blessed to be a blessing. And not only did he save the nation of Israel in its seed form, but he ended up saving the nation of Egypt as well. That's a picture of the church and the world that's a picture of a person functioning in the kingdom that's prosperous in the church and still having influence outside the church do you see that Hmm. one other guy that comes to mind go to 
Go to Daniel chapter 6. I don't think I gave you this, guys, but Daniel chapter 6. I want to look at this real quick, and then we'll keep moving. Daniel 6, verse uh, 13. We've, we've, we've left this story for Sunday school most of the time when it actually belongs part of the kingdom. Daniel and the lion's den. Number one, I'm like, what a story to be telling in Sunday school, really? <laughs> if you think about it. <laughs> Daniel 6, 13. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, and for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. So basically, the, the, the world system there had, in Babylon had, had made a law that made it illegal for Daniel to do what he was doing praying and worshiping God three times a day. That he was only to worship, at, and when he heard a certain sound, he was only to bow down and worship this image, this idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the world system was passing laws that was trying to hinder believers. Let him who have ears to hear, hear. And the king, when he heard these words, were greatly displeased with himself, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver them, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, King, O oh now, oh now king, no, O oh king, that is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute which the king established may be changed. So, so once the king released that word, it was done. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spake, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually... Not seasonally, not when it feels good, not when it's convenient, <laughs> but whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. <laughs> oh, I could. Mm. Now the king went to his place, his palace, and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually be able to deliver you from the lions? I just imagine there was this Calls and a silence there as the king was waiting for a response, having a faith and an expectation to hear that Daniel was about to testify of what the Lord has done. Hmm. Now the king says, Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they have, no hurt, they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also. O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and brought those men who accused Daniel and cast them where? into the den <laughs> verse 25 all the way down here it says the king Darius wrote to all the people nations language that dwell in all the earth peace be multiplied to you I make a decree remember the decree couldn't be changed right I make a decree that every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel I hope that sinks in. Yeah. Tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for, for he is a living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to, to the end. He delivers and he rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel, what? Prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You've got a heathen king preaching the gospel of the kingdom because there was somebody willing to endure a narrow place. 
There was a believer that was willing to endure a den of lions, and because he was able to endure a den of lions, laws of the nation got completely changed, and then heathen kings started recognizing a greater king, a superior king, who has a superior law that has signs and wonders following as part of his kingdom. Are you kidding me? But here's what we want to do. Oh, there's a den of lions. Let's go around the easy path. Let's find that broad path. See, what if your narrow way, what if your narrow path, you have to go through a den of lions? What if on your narrow path, you, you don't get to skip around the den of lions? See, when you start deviating from the narrow path, hallelujah, when you're trying to, trying to get away from the den of lions, you start wandering off the narrow path. You end up in a, on a broad way, and many go that way. <laughs> many go that broad way, but few go the straight or narrow way. See, the narrow... That word straight, it used to mess me up because I'm thinking straight is in point A to point B. Right? How many of you thought that growing up? Straight is the gate, straight and the narrow, right? I've learned that his narrow road goes like this. Am I the only one? Am I on the wrong path? Or have you been walking on that narrow road too? Yeah. yeah. See, I used to think, again, when I was reading, I was thinking straight, you know, it's point A to point B. Straight. No, the word straight doesn't mean that. The word straight means narrow, tight place. I can go weave in and out, up and down, mountain, valley, over the river, through the woods. I can go those things and it, be, it still be a narrow path. Matter of fact, I would submit to you that's what the narrow path looks like. That's how you navigate the narrow places. That's how you na navigate the tight places. That's how you maintain discipline in the midst of distress. Uh, put up that next slide. I'm a slide uh, probably like 11 or so. Let's go. Go to the one that says Matthew 7. Whichever number that is. Matthew 7. There we go. Matthew 7, 13, 14. Enter ye the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. 7.14 says, Because the straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few, few there be that find it. See, we think that on that path, a den of lions would lead us to destruction. When it's actually the path that leads us to devotion. When I deviate from that path that may put me in a den, it's there that Daniel cried out unto the Lord. It was there that Daniel had a devotion unto the Lord that shut the mouths of the lions. I don't know what den you're in this morning, but keep your devotion in the midst of this narrow place. This place of navigating this, this tight place This place between the straits. 17th of Tammuz, 9th of Av. Bring that Zechariah verse back up. In Zechariah 8, it talks about the different fasts, and it talks about the fast of the fourth month. The fast of the fourth month. The fast of the fourth month is, the month, is talking about the 17th of Tammuz. Yeah, keep going. I should have a slide there, brother. If you don't mind. Huh. <laughs> 
almost. There we go. You got it right there, the Mitzar. Put it back. Now go into, you'll see Zechariah 8. Keep going through the slide. You slide number 10. Slide number 10. I want you to see this. Zechariah 8, 15 through 19. As he's putting that up, there you go. So again, in these days, I am determined to do good to Jerusalem. This is the Lord speaking. I am determined to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Look what he says. Do not, what? He's determined to do what? We sung about it this morning. He's determined to do good, but I'm still having to go through this tight place? And he says, don't fear in the midst of this tight place. These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. How do you navigate the tight place? Speak truth in love. <laughs> Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. Zechariah 8, 17 says, Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. How do you navigate the tight place? Don't have evil thoughts or evil intentions towards those people that may have wronged you. That's how the kingdom functions. Bless those that persecute you and despitefully use you. Right? It says, then the word, verse 18 says, Then the word of the Lord of the hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth. Look what happens. Shall be joy and gladness and cheerful what? For the house of Judah, therefore love, truth, and peace. Look at what he's saying. He said, I'm taking this time frame, this time frame of between the straits, this time frame of this narrow place, and where you used to fast and mourn in the midst of this, I'm coming with Messiah. I'm coming, there's coming a day where I'm going to take your fast, and I'm going to turn it into a feast. And so you can feast in the midst of this tight place. No more weeping, no more sorrow, even though you may feel like it on the outside. Let a spontaneous praise of joy be release from you break the captivity of your praise in the midst of that tight place because he's prepared a table for us even in the presence of our enemies that we can feast I don't have to go through this tight place with my head down and dragging I don't have to go through it that way why because he already went through it for me for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And I'm in him, and he is in me. And as he already went through those things, I can feast in my narrow place. I don't, I'm not subject to the environment, environment of my narrow place. I'm subject to the environment of another world. <sighs> I hope you get this. I'm not subject to the environment. I'm subject to the ecosystem of heaven. Go, go to those last, very next to last slide. I, I just added that in. Next to last slide. Everybody see that pretty good? Now go to the next one, the very last one. Same place, but notice how it got dark. I was standing there when that happened. Those are my photos. This area is known as the Valley of Shadows. There should be a verse popping into your mind right about now. You see it? Psalm 23. Keep that up there. Keep that up there. I want you to, I'm going to read this. And I want you to look at this. The Lord is my shepherd. That says a lot right there. Is he? Is he your shepherd? Are you trusting in your shepherd? Are you trusting in him to lead you and guide you? If so, it may be a narrow path and it may go like this. Do you think shepherds in Israel walked in a straight line? They walked in a narrow way. 
But there was a lot of rocky areas there. They had to navigate through certain things. And when a serpent or a scorpion showed up, I don't run from them, I step on them. <laughs> well, you shall trample upon. Come on. In order to stay on the narrow path, stay on, navigate the narrow way, there may be some den of lions that show up. There may be serpents, there may be scorpions. I don't allow, allow those things to cause me to deviate from the narrowness. Because in the narrowness, there's nearness. I hope you hear me. In the narrowness, there's nearness. And it's my nearness to Him and my nearness in Him that helps me navigate the narrowness. And so if you're having trouble this morning trying to navigate your narrowness, then there's a call for you this morning to come near. There's a call for you to come near and he's begging you and he's calling for you. He's asking for you, saying, come near. Let me guide you. Let me shape you. Let me lead you. I've been watching you and you've been trying to go here and trying to go there, but let me lead you. Let me guide you because I'm your shepherd. And in John 10, he said, he is the good shepherd. He says, I shall not want... He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Is that still up there? Yeah. Do you see any green pastures there? This hit me this morning. I had to get this slide up. I was like, man, this ain't in here, but it hit me on the way here. And I was like, oh, my goodness. David is walking through this valley of shadows, literally this valley of shadows. You know what he's saying? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. I didn't see any green pastures there. So what was he talking about? He was talking about his interior world living in a different world. He was talking about a kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And though in that he wasn't bound by his environmental system, he, environment. He wasn't bound by the shadows that were around him because he was abiding under a shadow already. Psalm 90, I'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He was already abiding under a nearness to the throne of God. And because he was abiding under that shadow, these shadows had no effect. Come on. So what shadow is affecting you the most this morning? How are you navigating your narrowness? We look at that in the natural and we see desolation, we see darkness, we see shadows, we see rocky areas. But you know what David saw? A green pasture called his presence. I can have a green pasture even in the midst of desolation. I can lay down and have rest even in the midst of chaos. I can navigate the narrowness and the tight places because of my nearness to him and his nearness to me. But the enemy would love to speak lies to us and say he's not near. The enemy would love to get our eyes focused on that shadow versus his shadow. The enemy would love to get us focused on the darkness and the hardness there versus seeing Jesus for who he really is as, as provider and protector, shield, refuge, strength in a time of need. You prepare, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. You are with me. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. <laughs> there it is. How do you navigate, navigate the narrow place? You need an anointing. <laughs> Hallelujah. You anoint my head with oil. So as the, the oil comes on my head, my mind's renewed. I can see things rightly then. My cup runs over. He's talking about walking in overflow in the midst of a dry place. That's called influence from the kingdom. Surely, goodness and mercy. We sung about goodness, we sung about mercy. Mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to read this last one to you, and then we'll close here. 
This is from the Passion Translation. The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. (laughs) His tracks take me to an oasis of peace. Do you hear that? An oasis of peace. The quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Lord, even when your path, listen, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness. Whose path? Taking me where? Deepest darkness. But if he's my good shepherd, I'm going to follow. I'm not going to deviate. It's when I deviate from that, whatever's in the darkness gets me. Because I'm not under the shadow of my shepherd. Fear will never conquer me. For you already have. Fear will never conquer me because you already have. Oh, hallelujah. (laughs) You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely for you are near. Do you hear that? I'll never be lonely because you are near. You become my delicious feast. Nearness and a feast. Are you kidding me? Zechariah said these fasts will become a feast. You can have a feast in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of all the things going around you. There's a table with your name on it and a seat with your name on it saying, come, feast, feast of the Lord, feast of the goodness of God in the midst of the chaos. Stand to your feet with me. I want our altar team to come down, our prayer team to come down. You become my delicious feast. Even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Just on Sunday... Just on Wednesday, just when we come gather as church, his love and his goodness pursues me how often? All the days of my life. Then afterward, when my life is through, it will return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. Hallelujah. I don't know what tight place you're going through right now, but I want you to know this. He's with you. I've come here to remove the lie that he's forsaken you. That he's not with you. Like, like God, where are you? I'm, I'm going through that. I just hear people crying out, Lord, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. And I don't see you in it. And he's right there next to you. I'm praying for this morning that Holy Spirit will come and illuminate your eyes of understanding so that you can see that there's more with you than against you. Elisha and his servant were surrounded by the enemy and Elisha's servant was getting all crazy and all up and in distress and Elisha prayed that his eyes be open he saw chariots upon the mountain and he said fear not for the Lord there are many, there's more with us than against us there's more with you than against you this morning there may be some against you but there's more with you than, than what's against you kingdom is not in meat and drink, but it's in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit. It's not my righteousness, it's not my peace, and it's not even my joy. What are you saying, Pastor? Well, listen to me. Philippians 3, 9. And being found in him, where? In him. 
not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. It's his righteousness, not mine. Peace, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. This is Jesus speaking. Peace I leave with you. My peace, the peace of Jesus. He's saying, I'm leaving it with you. I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 15, 11. The things that I have spoken unto you, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be made full. His righteousness, it was his peace that he gives us, and it was his joy that he takes and gives us that our joy might be full. So how can I endure different things? How can I endure trials? How can I endure tribulations? How can I have joy in the midst of an environment of sorrow? Because it's not my joy. It's His joy. And I'm partnering with His joy because I'm in Him and He's in me. And I'm near to Him and He's near to me. I can have joy in the midst of that. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. You are near, O Lord, and your commandments are truth. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and what? He'll draw near to you to cleanse your hands, your sinners, and purify your hearts in double-mindedness. So this morning, here's what we're going to do. We're not praying you out of your narrow place. I would be doing you an injustice and keeping you immature if I prayed you out of your narrow place. I want to see Christ be formed in you. I'm laboring to see Christ formed in you. And so for me to pray you out of your narrow place would be an injustice to you. But I will pray that your faith would not fail. Jesus had an opportunity to pray over Peter exempt him from the sifting that was coming. But did Jesus do that? He said, no. He said, Peter, I know there's a narrow place coming. I know there's a shaking coming. I know there's a sifting coming. But I love you so much, and there's a great destiny on your life because one day, on the day of Pentecost, you're going to get touched by the power of God. You're going to stand up, and you're going to preach, and 3,000 are going to come into the kingdom. And so because I know the end from the beginning, I'm going to allow you to go through this sifting because I know there's a harvest attached to the other side. So I'm just going to do this, Jesus said. He said, I'm going to pray that your faith would not fail. Now we can touch, we can agree, we can minister to the needs in the midst of this, but we're not praying, altar workers, we're not praying them out of the narrow place. We're praying that their faith be strengthened we're praying for, for them to see Christ in the midst of it because there's somebody on the other side of their narrow place that's witnessing what's going on. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace weren't exempt from the furnace. But the king came down, a heathen king, came down and looked and saw some men burning in a furnace. He said, didn't we put three men in there? But I see what? Four and he looks like what? 
a heathen king saw a fourth man in the fire and described him as, my goodness, that's the Son of God. Because there were some disciples that were willing to endure the narrow place, that were willing to navigate the narrow place to see Christ formed. And guess what? He was near to them in the narrowness. He was with them in the midst of the fire. He's with you in your furnace of affliction right now. He's with you in your narrow place, in your tight place right now. In this time between the straits, know that He's with you. He's not left you. Just lean into that nearness. And if you need help leaning into that nearness, I want you to come right now. I want you to come to this altar. We got some teams that are going to pray and agree with you to recognize Jesus in the midst of your narrow place right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for a grace to navigate the narrowness. That you're near to us in the midst of narrowness. We thank you as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. We thank you that Romans 8, 28 and 29 is still true. That all things work together for the good, not good and evil. All things work together for the good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. It says, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're conformed to hit the image of His Son. Your narrowness, your tight place is is shaping you and molding you and conforming you to His image. There's help, there's rest, there's peace. Because you're, as a believer, you're part of a different kingdom. You're part of a different world. You're in this world, but you're not of this world. You've been born again from a higher realm, a greater reality. And from that place, you have influence in this world. That's why you can sustain all the different things. And when I go through the furnace, when I go through the pit, when I go through all these places the, and the Lord is with me, people around you will recognize that the Lord is with you. And then there's an opportunity to reap a harvest. Hallelujah. For those that are not down here, uh, let me just say this. If you need to leave this morning, you are free to go. We bless you. We bless you, we bless you, and we deploy you as agents of the kingdom to go out and increase the kingdom and advance the kingdom throughout all the regions of this area. So you are free to go. For those of you that are out there that are staying but you're not down here, I want you to, we're going to worship, and I want you to worship. And for those of you that are praying, you guys just keep praying, keep contending, keep keep moving and ministering as Holy Spirit leads. So we love you guys. Thank you again for those online. We love you guys that, are, that tune in with us every week. We bless you. We're not praying you out of your narrow place. Hallelujah. We're not praying you out of that, but we're praying that your faith would remain faithful and true in the midst of the narrowness. In Jesus' name. Yeah.